Okay, we are at 2 o'clock here in Iowa, so um, I'd like to welcome everyone to, to today's Safer Sim webinar. Uh, the Safer Sim webinar series features researchers and students sharing detailed information about their projects. These projects use simulation to address transportation safety issues. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to point out the chat box in your Adobe Connect window. Uh, feel free to use that chat box for any questions or comments. There will also be time at the end of the presentation for questions and discussion. Now I'm excited to welcome our presenter from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Francis Tater, Tainter, and our presenter from University of Wisconsin-Madison, Kelvin Santiago Chaparro. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. We're, we're really excited to um, be here today talking about some of the collaborative work that we've done in part of these two safer center projects that we're going to be discussing today. Um, so myself uh, from UMass and Kelvin from Wisconsin will be talking today about uh, flashing narrow arrows uh, used in the left and right turn application um, as a mixture of uh, static evaluation as well as a field evaluation. And we'll talk about that a little further, but before I get into that, uh, I just want to do a quick shout out to the, the research team that has worked on this project over the past couple of years. Um, so a lot of people have put a lot of work um, from both here at UMass and our colleagues out at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so shout out to all those people who have worked on this project the past couple of years. Um, so getting into just a quick outline of the presentation. Um, I will, be, uh, I will be giving you an introduction and background here on the uh, two-pronged project that we're about to present to you all. Um, I will be discussing the computer-based static evaluation. Um, so I'll go into details uh, on the methodology and results. Um, and like I said, this is two projects. So I'll be talking about the left-turn project and right-turn project static evaluation. Um, and then I'll be handing it over to uh, my colleague, Kelvin, who will be discussing the field evaluation uh, the data procedures and analysis uh, for the left turn and the right turn project as well. Uh, and then he'll wrap up with a discussion and a few of our conclusions and contributions moving forward from this project. So with that, I want to just kind of give out the generic problem statement for, for both of these projects. So uh, looking at the left turn project, essentially what we want to do is develop guidance for using the change in clearance intervals and transitioning between the protected and permissive left turn phase, aka when we use that flashing yellow arrow as a permissive left turn phase, do we need the all red clearance interval when transitioning to it? Um, and if so, uh, uh, looking into a little bit more of the details of uh, the duration of that phase uh, as well as other aspects as well. And then looking into uh, the right turn project, uh, we're implementing the, the flashing yellow arrow in the right turn, and we're developing an understanding of potential yielding compliance um, from vehicles when performing a right turn uh, with the implementation of that right flashing yellow arrow. Um, and in doing so, like I mentioned previously, uh, we're going to be using a computer-based static evaluation and a, a field evaluation uh, vehicle trajectory study uh, to analyze these left turn and right turn flashing yellow arrows. Um, so just to get into a quick little background here, um, so for those of you who are unaware, uh, the, the Flash and Yellow Arrow uh, was implemented in the 2009 edition of the MBTCD. Um, a lot of that work stemmed from this National Cooperative Highway Research Project uh, conducted uh, almost 20 years ago or so. Uh, and essentially what this project, and it actually needs a, a lot of the researchers from uh, both the University of Wisconsin and the uh, University of Massachusetts uh, took part in this project as well, so it's interesting to see it come this far. Uh, but that project uh, evaluated permissive, permissive left turn control, um, so the circular green indication, the flashing yellow arrow indication, um, circular yellow indication, and things of the like. Uh, and essentially, the, uh, the flashing yellow arrow yielded a significant improvement in comprehension rates for yielding uh, and was thus included in the 2009 edition of the MUTCB. And many state agencies and practitioners across the country have since then uh, begun implementing this for their protected permissive left turn permissive control. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, just a little bit of the, the uh, background in the implementation and comprehension. So uh, obviously the, the flashing yellow arrow is relatively new, um, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of research has gone into uh, investigating the post uh, investigation of 
uh, flashing yellow arrows. So the impact of the flashing yellow arrow on the existing circular green, green permissive indication. Um, so a lot of research uh, research has gone in both you know here at UMass out of Wisconsin discussing the, the exposure of the flashing yellow arrow indication and whether that has a negative impact on the circular green, uh, which as a result it does not. Um, and then other other research across the country has looked into um, improving the the comprehension rates of the flashing yellow arrow. So so when you introduce things such as supplementary signage up on the mass arm, whether that has any difference uh, in terms of improving the comprehension rates for the flashing yellow arrow. Um, and then this last bullet at the bottom I think is uh, very unique to uh, Saberson in and of itself. Uh, that we want to look into the red light running that um, that still exists today uh, throughout the United States. Specifically, I want to focus on this because of the all red clearance interval that we're looking into uh, as part of that left turn project. Uh, so looking into that all red clearance interval, how does this impact red light running? Um, and I'll discuss that a little bit later on uh, in the presentation. So. Now I'm going to be discussing, uh, like I mentioned, the left turn static evaluation portion. Um, so this is the left turn project. And so initially, we developed a static evaluation. Um, and you can see actually a screenshot up here in the top right of a sample question that was given in part to this survey. Uh, the survey was developed in the SurveyMonkey platform. Um, and so in this sample question, you can see a video up there uh, and that video can be played as many times as possible by uh, the participant. Uh, and that video displayed a sequence. It was a randomized sequence, a protected permissive uh, sequence, including both the circular green in a cluster head, uh, as well as the flashing yellow arrow in a four-section vertical signal head. Um, and so you can see there as well, it says current signal display. So that was the last signal displayed in the sequence. And essentially, the participants were asked to predict the next signal that they would see in that sequence, given a, an assortment of multiple choice responses. Um, and so it's, what we're looking into here is evaluating the comprehension of protective permissive left turn phase sequencing, um, and specifically looking into um, all of those transition periods that I was mentioning earlier. Um, this specific static evaluation was uh, administered to uh, people all across the United States. So in addition to that, we looked into any uh, potential regional impact on driver comprehension um, based on varying state agency implementation uh, of the flashing yellow arrow. And you'll notice on the bottom right there, I have that, that table that includes uh, a list of scenarios. Um, this just uh, indicates all of the various phase schemes uh, that were investigated in this project for both the circular green permissive indication and the flashing yellow arrow permissive indication. Um, and all that means is these are all the various uh, phase schemes that were included throughout the 15 sequences uh, that each participant saw in a randomized order. So a little bit about those scenarios. I'm not going to delve into the, the various scenarios too much, but I want to show you just examples of what we're focusing on. Um, so when you're looking at, say, the, the, the solid green arrow protected phase, uh, transitioning to the solid yellow arrow. Um, and then you have what we're talking about here, that all red clearance interval, before that circular green permissive is provided to the drive. Um, and so this is in that cluster signal head. Um, and we wanted to look at both this aspect as well as with the flashing yellow arrow. So again, we're looking at this four section vertical signal head with the flashing yellow arrow. And again, with that same sequence, just in a different display, it would be that solid green arrow protected phase with the change interval here. And then you have, again, that all red clearance interval that we're focusing on here, moving into that permissive flashing yellow arrow. And again, we're focusing on this solid red clearance interval, or this all red clearance interval, rather, um, to see whether uh, drivers will understand uh, the sequencing of this and, and how their reactions uh, uh, will be displayed uh, in the field evaluation, which Kelvin will discuss a little bit uh, later on in the presentation. And so following this initial static evaluation, once we uh, obtained all of the results, uh, we found some unique uh, uh, data. We wanted to further investigate that and kind of hone in on four concrete scenarios, two for the four-section four vertical signal 
and, and two of them for a five section cluster signal. Specifically, and I'll give you a second here to look at all of these various sequences, um, but specifically we're looking at that direct transition from the all right clearance interval to the permissive indication for both sequences or both scenarios with each indication. And then in addition, we're looking at the prediction of the all red clearance itself. Um, and so these are the four sequences that were investigated in this follow-up static evaluation, uh, which received about 100 additional um, responses from people, again, across the United States. And so going into the initial static evaluation, so this is what I spent bulk of the time uh, talking about here. So that, that received about 200 people from across the country. Um, and, and this majority of respondents were under the age of 24 with five to nine years of driving experience. Uh, this, is, this is pretty typical with a lot of the survey uh, uh, projects that we do here based on you know, the college bias. Uh, a lot of people younger are participating in these survey studies. Um, and on the right there, you see just a, a, a quick breakdown of the demographic. Uh, it's interesting to look at. There's nothing too significant to see from that graphic. Um, but it's really interesting to know, note all of the, uh, the varying percentage correct responses. Um, you'll see that, that none of them exceed significantly uh, above 50, barely under 60. Um, and I want to move forward actually into this graphic here, which displays the total comparison between the circular green permissive, permissive scenarios and the flashing yellow arrow permissive scenario. Um, so you see the 67.8 is the average percent correct responses for all of the circular green permissive scenarios compared to the 57 percent for the flashing yellow arrow. Um, and although there is almost a 12 percent difference, this is not a statistically significant difference. Um, and therefore, uh, we can say that although the flashing yellow arrow does not yield as high percent correct responses, uh, there's no statistical significance between those, statistical difference between those two numbers, um, which I think is important to note given uh, the near 10 years that the flashing yellow arrow has been in implemented um, across the country. So it, it's interesting to note that the flashing yellow arrow is almost uh, just as well understood as that circular green when it comes to the sequencing of the protected permissive left turn phases. And then lastly, I want to just talk about the follow up static evaluation for this left turn project. Uh, and like I mentioned, this was four scenarios that were investigated in this survey. Uh, and on the top here, you see the cluster signal head sequences. Um, in each of these figures, you'll see the sequence on top, followed by the, the percent of responses. Um, and on the x-axis of each of those figures, you'll see the multiple choice responses uh, that were available for each participant. Um, so looking at that top left figure, uh, it's interesting to note that 72% of people correctly predicted that all red clearance, uh, with the second most option being the permissive green indication, uh, which could also be a potentially correct response in that case. Um, and then when you look to the bottom left in the four section uh, flashing yellow arrow signal head, in this sequence, again, we we're asking them to predict that all red clearance. And again, a significantly larger number of people, 59.3%, correctly predicted that all red clearance interval in this case. Uh, you'll note that the second correct response in that was the permissive indication. Um, so we can say that the, the significant majority of people are predicting the all red or the flashing yellow arrow and have a generally good understanding of the sequencing when it comes to flashing yellow arrows. Okay, and now shifting gears a little bit, uh, we're just gonna talk uh, about the static evaluation uh, for that right turn project. And just to kind of wrap our heads around that one more time. Um, so that right turn project was investigating uh, the implementation of the flashing yellow arrow in the right turn fashion and investigating the driver behavior and their yielding compliance uh, when the right turn flashing yellow arrow was provided. Um, and so the graphic on the top there displays all of the various displays to uh, participants. Uh, there was a circular green ball, a circular red ball, as well as that flashing yellow arrow in the right turn. 
Um, this study also did investigate the introduction or the inclusion, rather, of the no turn on red sign, uh, as well as a proposed dynamic no turn on red sign. Um, on the bottom here, you'll see that is a prompt that was given during every scenario throughout the survey. Uh, so it says, as a driver turning right, check all those that apply to the scenario shown in the picture above. And each participant was uh, told to select those options given the pictures that were shown, such as these. So these are four quick snapshots of images that were provided throughout the scenarios. Um, you'll note that there's, a, there's minor differences in these. Uh, you'll see that three section uh, signal head on the top two images. However, on the top right, there's a pedestrian in that crosswalk adjacent to the, the vehicle. And then on the bottom, you have the flashing yellow arrow included in a four section vertical signal head. And again, on the bottom right, you have that pedestrian that was present. So we were looking into uh, the compliance rate, how drivers would react if there was no pedestrian, if there was a pedestrian. And so they were provided an, an array of responses that I, that I talked about previously. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, data and a lot of colors on this graphic, but it's really interesting to actually note. Um, so each of the colors represents uh, the permissive indicator, or the indication, signal indication. Um, so the green represents the circular green, the yellow with the right flashing yellow, and the red as a circular red indication. Um, and then the hatched columns that you see up there uh, are the scenarios that have included a pedestrian. Um, and it's really important to note, so if you look at the columns under right turn permitted, I think it's really interesting to note here that there is little to no difference between the response rate for the circular green indication than the right flashing yellow arrow indication. This shows that the, the participants are choosing both of those, those signal indications uh, either way and, and understand that they have the permission to take that right turn given these signal indications uh, which bodes well for the flashing yellow arrow. Um, and the other thing I want to point out on this would be the yield before entering intersection. So that's on the bottom portion of the graph there. Uh, you'll see the difference between the circular green and the flashing yellow arrow are significantly different. And so the flashing yellow arrow provides a stronger yield compliance as seen by the responses of the participants yield before entering the intersection as compared to the circular green and particularly when there is a uh, when there is a pedestrian there that's obviously very important um, so that is a significant takeaway from this second static evaluation in the right turn project and so with that I think we're going to transition into the uh, field based uh, field-based evaluation, and so I will turn it over to uh, Kelvin, who will be uh, talking about this. What I was talking about is that we need to identify ways to measure vehicle behavior on the field in new ways that allows us to gain insight into the same, in the same way that a driving simulator experiment provides. Um, we have done research using driving simulators and flashing yellow arrows, and one of the good things about that is that it gets us an insight into the trajectory of the vehicles. So, uh, in the picture, what you see is a the traditional approach that we use to measure vehicle behavior on the field. We install a video camera, we go through the video, analyze it frame by frame. So I think a lot of us have done that in the past. And that's still a valid approach. In fact, I'm going to be using some of those procedures for one of the components of the project. But we wanted to see if we can do something more than that, if we can get that trajectory level of data. And one of the things that we're doing is uh, rely on one of the technologies that we have here at the at UW-Madison that we have shared and we have collaborated on and using it with the University of Massachusetts and the University of Oregon. And what that technology allows us is to get a real insight into the behavior of left turning vehicles. And what I mean by that is that we can get the actual trajectory of vehicles, then analyze the behavior, how they react to changes in signal status. In signal status. Now, that technology is not something new, it's something that uh, a lot of intersections across the country have. We're all familiar with the with vehicle detection systems. One of the technologies that 
are available in out there that are commercially available are radar based vehicle detection systems like the one you see on the on the picture that detection system is basically used as a, as a replacement for loop detectors so it already tracks the position of vehicles it actually tracks the speed of vehicles but unfortunately there are no ways to collect that data so if you've seen some of our presentations in the past what we've been able to do with this is that we can instrument the signalized intersection and while the radar device is actually monitoring vehicles on the approach we intercept the communications in some sense or form not really exactly what happens but you can think of us tapping into the data stream of the of the radar device without interfering with the loop detection operation so we tap into the data stream of the radar device using the instrumentation shown on the figure i'll mention other type later in the process but this is a typical instrumentation in fact this instrumentation took place in appleton wisconsin we instrumented several intersections one of them had a flashing yellow arrow on the left turn and what we did is actually log the vehicle speeds and the vehicle position of all the vehicles that were approaching an intersection approach. Once we have that kind of information, it all sounds good, but unfortunately, one of the challenges that we're going to have when we log vehicle trajectory data is that it includes everything that the sensor, that, that the sensor sees. That means that it includes in urban environments, it includes parking lot information, or parking lot movements, it includes gas stations in the case of ours, our intersection. There was a gas station nearby, so a lot of entering and exiting the gas station. So all that noise becomes a, a little bit of a challenge. In addition to, again, the sensor is pointing at the approach, so from time to time you see vehicles from a conflicting approach show up on the, on the sensor data. So that challenge is something that um, we had to figure out a way to to solve because uh, what we want is this data set that you see here original turn into a data set that it's classified so that we can look at only the behavior of left turning vehicles so um, to filter out the approach we establish a set of rules that are based on the expectations of traffic behavior at a signalized intersection the red dash that you see on the line on the, the red line that you see on the figure that is actually a theoretical stop bar location. Now, that theoretical stop bar location, what it allows us to do is say, we're only gonna consider vehicles that were found upstream of the stop bar and that were also found downstream of the stop bar. Without getting into the details of all those procedures, that significantly clears the noise in the data. In addition to that, we're not gonna consider any vehicle who it's obviously in the parking lot and we can do those with some hard rules in terms of the coordinate boundaries that are in the data set but once we have that once we have a clear definition of vehicles who actually use the approach then what we need to do is classify the vehicles by lane now if you look at the if you remember the previous figure one of the challenges that we have with that data set is that Visually, it's very easy to assign lane information. Sometimes it gets a little bit more challenging because some vehicles kind of like to be on the edge of a lane or some like to be on the in-between lanes. Uh, and those vehicles become hard to, to classify. In addition to that, we wanted to come up with procedures that could be used at different intersections. So we wanted to limit the amount of human error that could be introduced into the into the process. So to classify lanes, what we rely on is a, um, a simple k-means clustering algorithm, which allows us to basically dump that data into the algorithm, specify that there are three lanes, add a few constraints into the into the process, and assign a lane to every single vehicle that uses the intersection. And by assigning a lane, I made a departure lane. So we focus the, the clustering analysis at the stop bar location. Because if the vehicle changed lanes before arriving to the intersection, it might have been captured that way. So we're only looking at departure lane. That's what I, that's what I mean when I say lanes. Now, once we have all this 
data, um, all this vehicle data classified by lanes, what this allows us to do is to get an insight into the actual trajectory that each left turning vehicle had at the intersection. For example, in the picture that you're seeing there, there's a left turning vehicle. As you, can, as you can see in the figure, we know the speed as a function of time. Now, that alone gives us information about how people decrease their speed. In other words, the acceleration changes or the acceleration values at the intersection. Um, is the acceleration constant? Are we seeing any additional reactions as a function of the signal status? It allows us to do that. Now, I mentioned signal status, but in the, fi in the figure that you see, there's not actual signal status it's because, well, unfortunately, what we have is signal is trajectory data. We don't have signal status information collected in here. But we're doing the research on flashing yellow arrows, so signal status information is obviously something that that we want to take into consideration. So what we did is as we were recording uh, signal status, uh, as we were recording trajectory data, we were also videotaping the signal head of the intersection. We placed those two data sets on the same reference frame. And in our end, uh, Wisconsin, we actually processed the signal status information manually. So we sat down and wrote down where everything happened and kind of documented when in the time frame the signal was flashing yellow arrow, when it was transitioned into a flashing yellow arrow, and all that stuff. Uh, on UMass ends, they actually implemented this procedure in a more automated way using some computer vision techniques to add the signal status information to the, to the data set. Once we have the signal status information, this is what the data allows us to, to look at. It's we have a single vehicle trajectory. We can go vehicle by vehicle and see what was the speed path, what is the acceleration values that we're seeing. Are we seeing any reaction to the change in signal status? Are we seeing any, are we seeing any reaction to the use of, uh, of an all red for the transition process? That kind of information is what this system allows us to do. In the figure, what you're seeing is basically the path that is followed by a, by a vehicle making a left turn and the location of the stop bar, which you're also seeing on the, on the, on the signal, on the top view of the signal. Uh, my apologies, the colors are inverted. So the blue one should be for the stop bar position. Now, once we have that information for every single vehicle, we can see do vehicles react to the to the shim, to the transition, and we're seeing on the on some of the research that people are not really aware of that. So we look at an individual vehicle, we look at a couple of individual vehicles. Like we're not seeing a lot of of reaction, nothing that suggests that the that they are significant effects on the on the on the behavior of the vehicles due to the phasing. We look at a combination of these vehicles. So this chart is a little bit different than the previous previous one. This one shows the signal status as a as a function of the vehicle position and as a function of time. As you can see in here, we have the red transition to the flashing yellow arrow. We can overlap vehicle by vehicle and see are we seeing any changes during this transition? Are people reacting to that? And what the data suggests so far is that we haven't seen a lot of of that reaction. Now, that on itself is something interesting. Like we're not seeing reaction, which is consistent with with the driving simulator research. In other words, once people make a decision to go, they're going to go based on opposing traffic. Um, however, uh, Obtaining this type of data, uh, it's something that we need to do, look more into the future. It's something that we need to look more at that in the future because while we obtain an interesting data set, we feel like there's a need for, for additional data and that's some of the future work that has been outlined on the on the report. Um, so that's it for the for the left turn information. So the left turn behavior is like we're able to get the data. Uh, findings are 
basically similar to what we're seeing on driving simulators, but we need to confirm with, with more data and additional sites. Now, on the right turn, unfortunately for the right turn locations, we didn't have radar data that we can use to analyze the behavior of vehicles. So we have to come up with some, with some surrogate measures in there. And the reason for that is that the reason we don't have a lot of vehicles is because the, the use of the right turn flashing yellow arrow is something that's starting to pick up at some locations. It's still in the early stages, so not a lot of, you have to find locations with a right turn flashing yellow arrow that also have a radar, and that has become a challenge. So unfortunately, we didn't have radar sites for the right turn flashing yellow arrow. That doesn't mean that we cannot rely on some of the standard procedures that we use for analyzing vehicle behavior. Now, on the figure, what you're seeing is a, a typical flashing yellow arrow for a right turn implementation. Um, the vehicle that you see, the vehicle that you see in there, is turning right, is able to see that flashing yellow arrow 100 meters away. So it's very clear. It's very conspicuous for the for the driver. And one of the reasons that people do the flashing yellow arrow on right turns is to increase awareness of pedestrians, like reinforce that message that you have to yield to pedestrians. Be careful with pedestrians. So one of the challenges is how do we quantify that? How do we quantify that the presence of a flashing yellow arrow actually impacts the yielding behavior of drivers? And for that, we have to basically define some parameters that I will show in a second and then measure those, the values, measure those values of the driver behavior using a frame-by-frame -frame analysis. That means that we sat down, we processed video for locations that have a flashing yellow arrow on the right turn and locations that do not have a flashing yellow arrow on the right turn in around the same area. We did this in Madison, Wisconsin, near college, near college, uh, the university, so a typical college town a lot of pedestrians all the time, so the site conditions were similar. What we have, the parameters that we define, and I'm not going to get into the technical details of the equations. I'm going to explain what we're looking for. Because we didn't have radar, we cannot reduce, we cannot monitor the speed. So the surrogate measure that we came up to understand in vehicle behavior is the time that it takes for the driver to complete a right turn. And that is for drivers that arrived to the intersection while the flashing yellow arrow was already there. So we establish a baseline of the time that it takes a vehicle to go from T1 to T2. And that's our baseline at a location with and with our flashing yellow arrow. So we establish that baseline for every single intersection. So we know what's the typical behavior expressed at every single intersection. We collected that data when there are pedestrians and when there are no pedestrians. In addition to the binary value of pedestrian, no pedestrian, we introduce a continuous value that represents how far along the crossings are pedestrians in. For example, if I'm a driver making a right turn and the pedestrian is just completing the, the crossing, I'm not going to react the same way as if I approach the intersection there's a pedestrian in the middle of the crossing. So we introduced that into the analysis, into the analysis process. So we introduced that as a percentage of the crossing. What percentage of crossing has the pedestrian completed? Now, using that pedestrian, using that pedestrian information, we establish a basically a linear model that defines the reduction, if any. In other words, change in behavior from the expected behavior. So for every single vehicle, we know what the expected behavior at the intersection is. We know how long it takes them to complete a, a crossing. What we model is the difference between the expected behavior and the actual behavior. And we model that as a function of the pedestrian position. The results for that model um, again, I'm not going to get into the details of the equations and you know, the, the parameters, but rather I think it's better just to show 
a graphical summary of what we're seeing. So the green line is the model showing the deviation from expected behavior as a function of pedestrian presence. As you would expect, when the pedestrians have barely started to cross, drivers don't really react to it. In fact, the reaction is minimal. Once the pedestrians have are very deep into the crossing process, in other words, the closer they are to the conflict point, then you're starting to see that drivers deviate a little bit more from the expected behavior. The graphic, the chart, what is showing is that, and this is preliminary data, what is showing is that there's a slight indication that perhaps the flashing yellow arrow at the very least is not having a negative effect and there's the potential for having a positive effect. And by a positive effect, I mean that it could make drivers more aware and perhaps um, positively impact the yielding behavior at the intersection. Again, this is very preliminary data. It's something that we need to look more into the details. We need additional sites. We need more data before reaching conclusions, but preliminary results done at least don't show a negative trend on what we expect. So that's the that's what we're getting on the right turn behavior based on field-based data. Now, summarizing the, the research contributions, one of the things that this project is doing is gaining a better understanding of protected and permitted left turn facing. In particular, what is the transition? How does the transition affect? Is there something significant on using different transitions to, to tra between the protected and permissive phase? Uh, also, Francis mentioned red light, red light running behavior, uh, the use of the all red clearance intervals, that kind of insight into the, into the driver's mind. Another thing that this project is doing is supporting some of the active research that has been conducted uh, with the NCHRP, with another NCHRP project that's looking into more details into some of this, some of the questions that we have found in this project and that have been established by some of the research team. And finally, this is the other thing that I, that I said I was gonna mention at the end, is that while the left turn data that we collected, the trajectory data that we collected on left turn was focused on a fixed location. Um, at UMass, one of the things that they have been doing for collecting similar data is use mobile deployments of that radar device. So they have taken that similar approach on a fixed location, but make it portable so they can actually go and study intersections that don't necessarily have a radar. So hopefully this approach in the future can get us, can get us better insights into right turn and behavior by introducing the speed information. But that's something that's a future work. With that, I think that's everything we have. So um, we'll take any questions now. I see that Don is typing. Kelvin, here's the question from Don. Thank you from Cliff and thank you from Don both. Um, Don's curious about the synchronization with walk signals. Um, do you have any thoughts? So um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, in, at least in Madison, and I'm assuming this is typical, when they do the the flashing alert on right turns, that actually aligns with the, with the walk sign. Or the walk indication. So yeah, they are they are synchronized.
Okay, so we'll give it a minute. Are there any other questions come in? Uh, before that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today and your interest in the SaferSim work. Um, the presentation will be available online um, on the SaferSim YouTube channel and on our website. Uh, and that should be up there before the end of the week. We will also share that link with all the registrants um, in the email, so look out for that. Feel free to share that with any colleagues that may be interested. Also keep a lookout for information on our next webinar, the impact of deflection angle on roundabout driver behavior. This is another project from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, and it'll take place on Tuesday, July 24th at 2 p.m. Central Time. So hope to see you there. Doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in, so uh, if there are questions, feel free to find Francis and Kelvin, um, send, shoot them an email, I'm sure they would be happy to answer. Thank you, Kelvin and Francis, for the presentation, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob.